Welcome, everybody, to Sitting with Sean Extraordinary, episode number five. Today, I have a pretty, pretty fucking awesome guest. His name is Josh Moreira. <laughs> Welcome, Josh. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, no problem. No problem. Uh, Josh is uh, from Brooklyn, New York, originally from the Bronx. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. Pretty awesome, man. So uh, would you like to give a formal introduction of yourself? Hey, yeah, sure. Uh, so, so yeah. So, like you said, I, I'm from, I'm, uh, I'm an artist from from New York. Um, I've been drawing for, I want to say, 26 years. I've been drawing since, since I've been drawing since I was like six, six or seven. Um, besides that, I mean, um, right? I'm a big uh, wrestling fan, big, big sports fan, mostly baseball. Um, I'm probably, I'm probably a bigger baseball fan than anything. Um, but besides that, yeah, you know, like, you know, uh, I'm an artist. Uh, I, I actually do, uh, artist appearances throughout the, throughout my, my, um, uh, my state, um, trying to, you know, trying to go to different States. I, you know, I've done so, so far, you know, I've been to Jersey, I've been to Connecticut, so you know the last next the next couple of years, hopefully I get to you know I get to expand on that. Yeah, and, and right off the bat, man, I want to say, and we talked about this offline, but I want to say like I am super impressed by your work, man. And uh, and you know my like every, I, I found you know I met you on Facebook through wrestling, and then uh, and then I was like, man, this dude is super fucking talented to the point now. Like I show my friends, I show my wife, I'm like, dude. Look at what this guy has done, and they're like, "Holy <laughs> shit!" Because <laughs> I mean, you don't you don't see talent like that every day, and uh, you're really, really fucking talented, man. So yeah, right off the bat, I want to say like, you know, you're awesome. Thank you, thank you. Um, you know, when it comes to that, you know, I feel, you know, I don't want to say I'm blessed, but I do feel I'm I'm very lucky, just because you know, since when I started at a young age, I didn't know where, where things were gonna go when it comes to to drawing when it comes to art in general. So, you know, for me to keep that at a young age to now, I think, you know, you know, that's, that's pretty, you know, that, that, that's, that prove you know, that proves that, you know, if you keep going, you know, anything is possible, you know, because when I started drawing, I know my brother used to do it, but then he kind of got away from it. Mm -hmm. At a young age, so he, well, once he tried to go back to it, he couldn't go back, you know. And I've yeah. been on myself, you know, I've been very fortunate that I haven't had that. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and it's pretty cool, you know. I I encourage everybody that that uh, does an art form to continue doing it uh, as as a a form of therapy and b to get better at it, you know, because it takes you from from a, a terrible day to having, you know, you it, it could put you in a different mind space. I don't know if that does that for you. Oh, it actually has. It actually did that. There was a thing that uh, that's that that happened to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to say about what twelve years ago. We'll get into that, but mm -hmm. it was one of those things where it was one of those things where where you feel when when you when you feel about them, and then when you don't realize the things that you're missing and how much it means to you. You know, that's where for me, that's where the love came. That actual Absolutely. love of what it came from. Not even, not even when I was young. It was when that happened. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, it's you know, it's it's pretty crazy. My my younger daughter, she uh, she draws, and she's very very good for her age. And I'm like, you need to keep going. I said, you need to keep going. Uh, <laughs> and, and 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 if this is something you love, like keep doing it. You know, I was like, I'll never criticize you for your drawing, for your artwork. Um, and she draws a lot of anime stuff and I'm like, keep doing it, man. If that's oh, yeah, something yeah. that you're, that you, if that's something you love and you enjoy, do it, keep doing it. Um, she, you know, for her age, she's only 11 and I'm like, yeah, keep doing it. You're going to, yeah. I was like, I was like, you keep doing it, you know, and you'll be as good as him. And I even point you out. I'm like, look what he draw. <laughs> she's like, it's, it's, it's actually probably true because even when I was at that age, you know, when I see kids now, when I see kids, when I hear like they're 13, 14, and I see like the the progress they they've made. I'm like, damn, they were better than me when I was at that age. So I can only imagine if they keep that up, you know, how they'll yeah. be 
when, once they they reach the age that I'm at now, you know, they're going to be even better. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I feel like I feel like us as adults need to inspire the younger generation to continue on what we've done you know, to, to be a better influence, uh, for them to be better for their future. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's get into it, man. Uh, from originally from the Bronx, man, tell me what it was like growing up in the Bronx. I'm going from growing up in the Bronx. I mean, you know, you always hear the stories about how bad the Bronx is and all that. Um, on my end, I've been very fortunate that, that, um, I got out of that. You know, I've never really dealt with something serious when I was in the Bronx because it was usually like um, if you hear the stories back then, like if you hear the stories from like the 70s or 80s. Yeah, it was really bad then. But like, you know, since I was since I basically grew up in the 90s and the 2000s, you know, I never dealt with stuff like that. Um, but growing up, like, you know, um once, once people hear you're from the Bronx, you know, they always have like the stereotypical thing about like, oh, you know, I'm either dangerous or where I live at is like really terrible, it's really horrible. But, you know, for me, at least, at least from on my end, I, I never really felt like that. Like I never felt I got that bad side, of, you know, uh, you know, over there. Um, you know, as I got older, I kind of understood why people would feel that way way but you know i would say when once i got older i started seeing more of the bad things you know mm -hmm. um, i've had family you know gone to jail i have a family member who's in jail for life for something that he did where i where i live at you know so it was more so when i got older i started seeing more of the bad stuff and it was more with people that i you know that i'm close with um but once i mean once I left, you know, once I left the Bronx, I pretty much just moved to Brooklyn with my with my current fiance. You know, mm -hmm. there was a lot of stuff that was going on with me personally um, that I ended up moving out. And honestly, it ended up being the best one of the best decisions I've made mentally. That's always to me, that's always important. Mental health, especially as I got older, more understanding of what that means is a real thing. I think a lot of people, yeah. some people don't realize, like, you know, when you hear about it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you you know, people could say it, you know, you know, when you hear somebody is not doing well and you hear about their mental health, it's very serious, especially when you start going through it. It's very, it's, it's very real. And, you know, when I was going through that, and then, you know, once I got past it, then, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, if I'm or if somebody is ever in a situation like I am, at least now I can know I could help them or give them certain advice that it's not just me talking to them saying like, oh, I'm here for you. I'm there for you. Yeah. You understand where they're coming from. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, you were talking about those stereotypes, man. And like uh, one of my one of my good buddies uh, that I met in the army. His name is uh, Will Nevart, and uh, he grew up in the Bronx. And he used to tell me all the time about growing up in the Bronx and growing growing up from uh, right down the street from Yankee Stadium and stuff like that, and like how crazy it was when he was growing up. And I was like, I was like, damn, dude. But like that stereotype, that stereotype is is what really kills it. You know, um, if you if you don't look at people on a human on a human level like that we're all human it doesn't matter where you come from like their stereotypes will come out and you'd be like oh yeah fuck that guy because he's from new york but i mean the reality <laughs> the reality is is that like is that like stereotypes are just stereotypes you have good people everywhere you got bad people everywhere exactly yeah yeah you can't you can't base a place based off of you know off of off of a stereotype and, and that's terrible you know um when i was when i was a kid man uh you know uh, the stereotypes that that I got because I was from the backwoods of Maryland was like, "Y'all, you're fucking hillbilly, you're you're hick, like you know, you uh, yeah, just all these crazy things." Like I grew up right around the corner from where Blair Witch Project was filmed, and everybody, you know, <laughs> yeah, they're like, "Oh, you're, you're fucking hillbilly." I'm like, "Well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> technically, you're not wrong, but <laughs> I mean, technically, you're not." But uh, but yeah, um, 
you know, and then you also hit another thing, man, that's really near and dear to my heart. And, and that, that's, uh, that's mental health. And, um, you know, just like you, I went through it through quite a few things that, that really, uh, beat my mental health up and, uh, it's a struggle. It, it really is. And I used to be one of those people that's like, oh man, the fuck up. Right. There's nothing wrong, you know? And then I started going through it and I was like, oh, it's real. It's real. And, and, and it's, it's something that you have to work on every day. It's not like, like a one and done, you know, it's not like a, I went through it and I'm good because every day is a battle. You wake up on the wrong side of the bed and your day's shit. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's yeah. I remember when I went through it what, all those years ago, when I, when I went through it, it was one of those things like you really don't realize what's going on until like you start to sit back and realize like wow there's something really wrong with you know with, with my mental state yeah it, it it creeps in and it's like it, it creeps in so slow that it starts to become normal to you and then that normal part of you you're like well i don't really feel like myself anymore like, what the fuck happened and then you have to uh you have to start working on on figuring out like why you feel that way and not just hot shot and saying I'm angry. Well, uh, why are you angry? Because there's a sub, yeah. there, there's a reason why you're angry, and and that's what a lot of people don't understand about that about mental health is that like a lot of us, especially men, we run to a super negative emotion like anger, hatred, uh, and, and we let that like corrode the rest of our lives instead of like being able to say, okay, I'm angry. What am I angry about? Like I know for me, I get angry really quick. Uh, not so much anymore, but I used to, and I would get angry real fast. And then I'd have to sit back and say, okay, well, why am I angry? Okay. Well, I'm actually really upset, but my go-to is anger. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it, mental health is something that's near and dear to my heart. Like, and, and that's how it's going to be for the rest of my life. Yes, sir. So, uh, obviously we're, we're talking about the, the artwork, man. When did this start? When did it start for you? Um, when it started for me, I would say uh, it started, like I, like I said, like around seven years old. I remember, like, I used to, like, you know, I used to doodle. I used to, you know, sketch up some stuff, right? Not realizing, like, what he meant. Um, but I think the reason why, when, when I started doing it more, one of my early memories is that I remember I used, I used to see, actually, my mom draw. So, like, she'll take us out to the park. We will have, like, you know, spend some time outside, right? And she also, she always used to bring, like, the sketch pad or, like, this book. And she used to, like, draw stuff, right? So one of the drawings I remember that she did was, like, um, I think she did Catwoman, right? So mm -hmm. when I was that young, I didn't realize what was going on. You know, I didn't say, like, oh, this is so nice. So yeah. at that young age, you or you don't realize it, you know, as I got older, that's when I was like, wow, that's what she was doing when, you know, yeah. when she was, every time she took us out, like she was, she was drawing, you know, and I think that's one of, that's one of the ways I picked it up. So mm -hmm. when I started drawing, like one of my early memories too, like when I started getting good at it, I want to say I was like in the third grade when people took notice to it. So like oh sorry the connection was no no you're good you're good oh. yeah no you're good it happens yeah so like um so like they'll ask me hey can you draw this up can you sketch this up you know stuff like that so that's mm -hmm. where I actually started to pick it up you know. And then it kind of like carried over from like from there, you know, all the way, you know, throughout the years being in school, you know, mm -hmm. I was always known as the guy who, who, who was the artist who drew, who was actually good in drawing and stuff like that. Um, when I got to high school, high school, it became a little bit different just because um, I went to, uh, you could say an art school, like my art, mm -hmm. you know, my major was, was visual arts. So with that, it was a little bit different because now I was surrounded by a couple of people who drew. So it wasn't like it was just me. 
it was I was in a I was in a setting where, you know, I was I was surrounded by artists. But then it turns out I was probably the best one around them. <laughs> so, <Nice. laughs> yeah. So like, uh, uh, but with but for everybody else, you know, there was a lot of people that I saw that had a lot of potential. I remember this was one guy, you know, at at that time he was actually very good at at, at portraits. He was way better than me in portraits, and mm-hmm. I think that was like one of the leg ups he had he had over me. And I remember like a couple of years after, like after high school, when I started picking it up, he saw how better I got at it. He was like, damn, he was like, damn, now you're better than me when it came to that. <laughs> and um, yeah, but like when it, when it comes to the experience, like, you know, that's that's how it started from. Um, that's where it carried over. But then also the interesting thing. Was that like maybe like when I was around thirteen or fourteen? I'm trying to remember exactly when. That's when I found out my my father drew. Mm-hmm. Like my father, my father was always an artist. But the thing is, is that growing up, he he really didn't do it. He wasn't really, you know, he wasn't drawing. He wasn't painting, he wasn't doing like what he was doing. One of the reasons he went back to it was because like when when my brother went to the army, right? He signed up for the army. Mm-hmm. It was around the time where the war in Iraq was happening, so there was always this possibility. That, there was always this possibility that he was going to be shipped out to Iraq, and mm-hmm. his first tour when he actually was shipped out to Iraq. My, that's when my dad started drawing again. That's when he started painting again, and that's when I found out, like, oh, he he was also an artist, and um, that's when he started doing it. That's when he started bringing it back up again. Like he'll start doing it again. Even to now, like he still does it, mm-hmm. but now he's been doing it a lot more just because you know, a couple of years ago he had a stroke, mm-hmm. so now he's so now he can't work, so now he does things to uh, you know pass time, you know get his thing, you know get his uh, you know mentally to be there to be to focus on something, so he's been doing mm-hmm. a lot more now, probably more than ever, but um, yeah, like. You know, I, I guess when it when it came to being an artist, it was pretty much you know it was pretty much the genetic, because both of my parents were yeah. artists. Um, mm-hmm. My mom since then and she's been retired from it for like a, for mm-hmm. God knows how long. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't do it, yeah she doesn't do it no more at all. But she's even oh, told wow. me, but she's even told me like seeing what I've been doing that that means more than than her even drawing so. That's something I always yeah. carry with. Absolutely, that's that's awesome. You come from a lineage of artists. Yeah, <laughs> like that. That's not something you hear every day. I I come from a lineage of artists, and I'm doing what they did, but I'm taking it to a national platform. That's actually pretty cool. That's super cool, man. And it, that's some of your artwork behind you, yeah. Oh well, there's only one. I only have one okay. art art piece behind me the one that i did uh that's the i'm gonna show you right now all right that's the daniel bryanson yeah uh, Bryant Danielson. Ooh. that is beautiful and he also signed it as well that's when i met him yeah 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 so one of the one of the cool things that that i i really enjoy about josh is that when he finds out who's going to be in the area or some or a show that he's working he draws up he does he does an art piece for that that artist and they look at it and they sign it and then he keeps it and that to me is like damn that is badass that is <laughs> sick you know because like like growing up a wrestling fan you see a lot of the a lot of a lot of wrestlers and you're like man i really want to meet that guy and this guy is living the dream over here and yeah, I try to, yeah, I, I try to, you know, uh, you know, like I said, it's one of those things where I've been very fortunate, mm-hmm. you know, especially living in New York, you know, there's always a lot of, you know, because New York is such a big market to a lot of things, you know, so when they do conventions, you know, when they do expos and stuff like that, you know, I've been very fortunate to, you know, not, not only, you know, not only following the info for it, but, you know, being financially ready for that because you know yeah. it's you know it's not easy it's not like it could you could just go to any show because there's people who still don't know about how the ins and outs of that you know 
going to the show, you got to pay for a ticket to go to the show, and then you got to pay to meet the person. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. one person is probably um, more expensive than the other, but it's just one of those things that you just got to be committed, you know, when it comes to that. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things is like, hey, you're going to do it or not? You know, yeah. it's not one of those things where people are going to, you know, force you to do anything. Um, yeah. It's always, you know, it's, it's whatever you want to do. It's whatever makes you happy. You know, there's people who, you know, hey, there's people who buy, you know, who buy $300 sneakers. I don't yeah. say nothing about that. That's what, what makes you happy. Hey, that makes you happy. You know, mm -hmm. me going to wrestling shows, meeting people, that makes me happy. So. Oh, absolutely. I know. I know when I was a kid, I got ridiculed for loving wrestling, dude. Absolutely <laughs> ridiculed for it. You know, they're like, you know, it's fake. And I'm like, don't talk to me about that. And but now I'm able to stand on stand my own two feet and defend why I love wrestling. And 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 that's I, I, I see as is like the culture that's happening now is like, you know, people are able to stand on their own two feet and defend why they like something. And and uh, but that's the whole that's that's a whole different story for another time, man. Um, what really what really I remember the first time I seen you, man, on Facebook. I was looking, and that was it. Was a picture of when you and your fiance met the elite, and I was like, yes. "That is sick! That is <laughs> sick!" Like you know, you you met the Bucks, you met Cody, you met Omega, and I was like, "Dude, that is and Brandy." I was like, "Dude, that is that's badass! Like that's not something you see every day." Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about that interaction. How was that for you, man? Oh, so like. um so, so meeting the Bucks and meeting Cody, that's actually hasn't been a one-time thing. So that's mm -hmm. always so like um, I'll get to that. Like what like you know. So the first who who did I meet first? I want to say I met the Bucks first. Mm -hmm. So I met the Bucks, and I did a I did an art piece of the Bucks. This was I believe this was where this is their this was from their Russell Kingdom appearance. Mm -hmm. They had they had like these yellow outfits, and they also had like a bunch of belts with them. So that was like the main art piece I did of them. So I ended up being on one of their episodes of Being the Elite because of that. I met them, they signed it, and I ended up being in the episode with Cody. Cody, I met a few times. Cody, uh, I the first time I met Cody, this was literally maybe a month after his release from WWE. So he was allowed to do like appearances. He's allowed to do like you could do certain appearances, so you could do like meet and greets. You just mm -hmm. can't perform. That's the difference when they had like their their ninety day clause. So mm -hmm. I was very fortunate. I was able to meet him like a month, or maybe like yeah, like a month after because he was doing um. What was the show he was doing? He was doing Arrow, so he made so the convention that he made an appearance on was Heroes and Villains. So it was more of like uh, they were promoting like the shows, you know, like the Flash show, um, the shows like on CW. Mm -hmm. And he was there, so he made an appearance for that. He was announcing that he was he was going to be on Arrow and he was going to be making um, numerous appearances on the show. So I got to meet him then. And I think the first art piece I did of him was the he was the IC champion. That was the first one I met. And that was the first time I met him and Brandy. Super nice. They were very, you know, very polite, super nice. I always had a great interaction with Cody. Um, he's probably my favorite person I've met to date, just because yeah. of all the interactions I've had with him. So when I met him, you know, that was very, that was very, you know, that, that was a very nice. That was a um that was a very nice thing. Yeah. Uh when I met the Bucks again, I'm trying to remember when I met them again. I think it was so I met them again, I want to say at a Ring of Honor show. Mm -hmm. And they recognized me. And I was like, how the hell do you guys like recognize me? <laughs> that, was my, that was with that was when me and my girlfriend started dating. I mean, it was like we were maybe like three months in. So they mm -hmm. recognized me, and I was like, "Damn! Like, how did how did you guys recognize me?" <laughs> and then, the reason why is because of the because of the episode they put me on. They remember the art piece. They um, 
Nick was the one that was doing the editing. That's how he mm-hmm. remembered. And um, oh, wow. So I think that was, a, yeah. So like it was them and I think Hangman. So they were the trio's champion. So that's how I was able to meet all of them. So like I said, I met them a few times. I think this was before Cody joined Bullet Club too. So they weren't even together yet. So when I met Cody again, it was a year after that. It was like about a couple of months when he when he joined Bullet Club. So the so the first time I met Cody, it was after his WWE release. Mm-hmm. The second time I met Cody, this was when he this was when he joined Bullet Club. A couple of months after he joined Bullet Club. Mm-hmm. Same thing happened. He sees me and he was like, Oh, he was like, You look from he was like, I felt like I've met you before, like I've seen you before somewhere. Mm-hmm. And I showed him the picture, and that's how he remembered the picture <laughs> with the drawing. That's awesome. Yeah. So we had a great conversation. And I remember I was wearing his shirt. I was wearing I was wearing the Bullet Club Cody shirt. Mm-hmm. He saw it and he was like, Oh, do you want me to autograph the shirt? And I was like, "What?" Well, I was like, "You sure?" He he and he was something like, "Yeah, man. You know, it will be free of charge." He signs the shirt. So that was the second time I met him, and I remember the third time I met him. I think this was a House of Glory show. I want to say when I met him again, he did a there was a show in Queens, New York, and mm-hmm. he was at him, and it was a nice conversation. Same thing. He rec- he recognized me. Like he was like, "Oh, you know, how's the artwork going?" and stuff like that. So he remembers stuff. That's always why that stuck out to me meeting Cody, because he remembered, like, not only that, but he remembers stuff. And I was like, yeah, Damn, that's pretty badass. So I was like, that's pretty cool. Like, he's, I'm just like, I didn't feel like just a fan. Like, I felt like he was getting to know me. Yeah. And I was like, that was one of the things that, that, that stuck out for me. And then when, we, when I met them all together for the first time, so it was Cody and the Bucks. This was after, um, was it after All In? No, 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 it wasn't after All In. It was before All In. So the first time I met them, this was when Cody dropped the Ring of Honor title. Mm-hmm. This was the weekend he dropped the Ring of Honor title. We were, it was the same place in Queens, New York, and um, yeah. he recognized me and my fi- and my fiance. He recognized both. They recognized both of us. Him, the Bucks, all of them recognized us. And then I remember he said, wait, you know these guys too? <laughs> like, <laughs> they, they, they asked the Bucks, like, oh, you know him too? <laughs> <laughs> that was like, uh, that was pretty, that was pretty cool. And then I think, you know, they were all saying too, like when we were all there, they were all saying like how they were very appreciative. Like they were like that, how it's always good to get support. Mm-hmm. You know, they're like very, you know, very humble. That was always one of the things that's always stuck out. Like no matter how many times you meet them, they're always very humble. They're always grateful that you you took the time to meet them, no matter how many times. It's like he they already they always said that that means more. You know, that always means more to them because you're always gonna come back, you're always gonna be a fan. Yeah. So like that was the so that was the first time I met them all. all Let me see. We're here. Oh. We're here. Yeah. <laughs> We're back. Yeah. So like, when I got to see them, when I got to um see them again, mm-hmm. they were doing like separate tables. They were doing separate booths. So mm-hmm. like, this was when Cody had the had the bear. He had uh, this is when he had Bernard. Mm-hmm. No, no, he had Barry the bear first. So I remember we met them and we took a freaking photo. You see the bear like this in the mm-hmm. back. It was so freaking hilarious. <laughs> But the same thing, we always had a nice conversation. Same thing when I met the same thing, like you know, that event. Um, all in when I went to Chicago and all in, the only person I got to meet was Cody. This was when he won the NWA title, so it was a day after all in. So he had the NWA title, and that's like that's when I got to see him again. Um, you know, he was even saying, like, thank you for making the trip because he knew I'm from New York, so he yeah. was like, he was surprised that I, I, I was there too. He was like, oh, yeah. you made it. He was like, what? <laughs> so he was excited about that. 
Um, the Bucks I didn't get to meet because uh, I think by the time their tickets were available, they were sold out. But I saw them on the show floor. They were kind of like a bunch of stuff, like a bunch of pops. Mm-hmm. But I didn't want to bother them because I was like, you know, I don't want to be one of those guys where I create attention that I'm talking to them, but then everyone starts showing up. I didn't want to do that to them because they're already yeah. busy as hell that weekend. So I didn't want to bother them. So what happened was that a couple of months later at their last final battle show, it was their last show, me and my fiance told them, like, we were at All In. And the show, the day of All In, that was actually our one-year anniversary. So they were like, wow, like, that's, they were like, wow, that, that's fucking awesome. Like, they were like, yeah. surprised with that. What ends up happening was that this is when they told us about All Elite Wrestling. This was before it was even announced. Oh, wow. Because what happens, Nick is like, oh, um, are you guys doing anything Memorial Day weekend? And I was like, as of right now, I was like, no, nah, we don't have any plans. So he tells us, so if anything, just just make sure you guys have that weekend cleared because there's something coming up and there's something big coming up. You know, he, he was like, he was like, we're only telling a few people. So just keep this in mind. And I was like, all right, cool. Like, I wonder what's going on. Right. And that's how yeah. I found out about all elite wrestling. He was the one that they were the ones that told us about it. So that's so dope. <laughs> that is sick, man. But like before that, I think when I met them, so that was so that was a month ahead. So a month prior, that's when I met them at that convention. So that was the big event convention. That's when I met all of them. So when we when we were going to the photo op, because there was a freaking that was a maybe about three hundred people waiting for them. And what happened was that when we when we got to the photo, when we got to the photo section, Cody, Cody, uh, Cody, Brandy, um, Matt, and Nick recognized us automatically. Kenny was the only one I never met. Mm-hmm. Kenny says, "Oh, you know, um, oh, like you you know this guy," because mm-hmm. he was surprised like how they reacted with me. Mm-hmm. He was like, "Oh, you know these guys?" Like, mm-hmm. so that ended up being a good same thing. That ended up being a great, uh, that ended up, that ended up being a great interaction. Um, yeah, so I got to meet them again. Uh, same thing with Cody. Cody was like, how he always appreciates seeing me. You know, um, same thing with, with with the Bucks. Kenny was super nice. Kenny was very, very humble. You yeah. know. You probably gonna hear me say that a lot, but he was very like he did not he's he did not expect the turnout that he got. He has such yeah. a big turnout that I wanted that he actually made that weekend alone. From what I was told about his appearances, he made about over a hundred k during his appearance in New York. Wow! Because because not only it was at convention, but he did a show before that day. He did a wrestling show. So he wrestled, I think upstate New York, he wrestled, and then he did the convention the next day. He made over a hundred grand. He did not realize, he did not, he did not, he said, he was like, he did not realize the the turnout he was going to get. Because what the, the thing with Kenny was that since Kenny was mostly in Japan, he also lived in Japan for a little while. Uh, he was very strict with his schedule. So mm-hmm. he wasn't gonna he wasn't gonna make an appearance in 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 the United States for that just to go back. Like he has to be very, you know, he has to be very his stru- his um his schedule has to be very structured that it yeah. makes sense. Like, all right, I'm I'm wrestling here, I'm here for the weekend, I'm here for five days. I think I can make this work. And that's why he yeah. did it. But once he did it, he was like, Wow, like phew. I made a lot of yeah. money. He was like, wow. Like he didn't he did not expect that. Um, but I think with him, the interactions with the fans means more, more than anything. Because he said to himself, like he took his time. Believe me, they had him. It was crazy. Because what happened was that because he had so many people, the people even they had single photo ops. So it wasn't even only in the groups, they had single photo ops. Kenny had the wow. biggest line. Pinky, Kenny had the biggest turnout 
out of all of them. And what happened was that because he had so many people on the autograph line and the photo op line, he had to like do autographs for maybe like the first like 20 people, then go back to the photo op line to do like 20 more people to go back mm -hmm. to autographs to back to photo op. So he had he was doing he was he was busy that that week. He was super yeah. busy. Yeah, I bet. And then the last time, and then the last mm -hmm. time I met them, no, no, not the Bucks. The last time I met Cody was at yeah, it was at uh, it was at Double or Nothing weekend. Mm -hmm. That was the last time I met Cody. And what happened was that that's when I got that the the post autograph. So like, this is the picture that you're probably talking about right there. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so yep. that was the one I got. <laughs> so that was the one I got <laughs> signed by them. That was that was the one I got signed by them. So Cody mm -hmm. remembers that interaction. Like he remembers what happened. He was like that day. He was telling me about how his knee. I think he had like a cortisol shot on his knee. He was like the mm -hmm. whole time he was in pain. When he was like he did his best job not to show it. He was like fuck. Yeah. That shit was killing me that day. <laughs> so we took the picture. Right. So then mm -hmm. what stuck out to me about this interaction that, that made it different more than all of them was that I went to go shake his hand. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm like this, like, oh, you know, it's always awesome meeting you. Know, I'm always going to support you. I stick out my hand to sh to I, I stick out my hand to shake his hand. Right. Mm -hmm. He tells he goes like this. Oh, no, man. Give me a hug. And he freaking hugs me. He hugs me and my fiance, right? That is awesome. And then that's when he, I was like, you know, congratulations to him about the about all elite wrestling. And he was like, no, mm -hmm. he was he was like, he was like, oh, congratulations, you know, to you too, for everything, mm -hmm. you know. He was like, you know, it wasn't for us, you know, for all the fans, you know, none of it would have happened. So for me, that always stuck out to me that my last time seeing him today. He freaking gives me a hug when I'm like, hey, you know, he gives me a freaking yeah. hug. So I yeah. was like, all right. I was like, that's cool. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. I, I've i met. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't know. I was going to say in the Bucks, um, when I I saw them at that same day, the Bucks, mm -hmm. and they recognize, and then they were like, holy shit, like, <laughs> you guys are here because they remember that they told us to clear out our days for the weekend. So that's, yeah, that was also awesome as well. That is that is super awesome. You know, uh, I've had I met Cody twice uh, back when he was in WWE. I met him. Oh, man. Back in 2011, right after he had finished the the gimmick where he had broken his nose and he was wearing the face mask. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and, and uh, I met him. I, it was weird. I got I got selected to. I didn't know it at the time, but I got selected to pretty much escort or be a chauffeur for the whole roster of WWE in 2011. Like I volunteered. Somebody was like, hey, I need volunteers. I was like, me, I'm just happy to be here. I love wrestling. It's like first show since I was a kid that I went to. And um, so they took us in this elevator, brought us down to the garage floor. They're like, hey, you're your details to meet and greet everybody coming through here. I almost passed the fuck out, <laughs> you know, cause I'm like, this is my dream. This is my dream. And, um, one of the, one of the guys that pulled up that I was able to, to help out was Cody. And like, the dude was so nice, super nice. Um, I didn't expect him to be nice. And, uh, and yeah, he was just super cool, really cool interaction with him. And then the next time I met him was when he, him and, uh, him and Dustin had just won the tag titles uh, the uh, from the Shield. And it was really cool interaction. Um, yeah, I don't know why Cody gets a lot of hate. I have no idea. He's such a nice dude. Yeah, he gets a lot of... You know what it is, too? Is that people just see it as the... Well, fortunately for him, you know, what it is, too, is, like, I guess... Now, more so now, people see him kind of hypocritical for going back. Yeah. Even though, even though, to be fair on everything, you know, me personally, I always felt like Cody was going to go back. 
because yeah. Cody had not only unfinished business, but he's he he's WWE. No matter what, he's WWE. Yeah. His first company was WWE. You know, his dad, you know, made a legacy with the company. You know, yeah. um, if you think about it, his whole, you know, his not not the gimmick itself. Like everything about him is WWE. His ring style is WWE. Like, mm-hmm. so I knew he was gonna go back. Did I think he was gonna go back this soon? No, but I. But now I understand. Like I was never mad about him going back. I was never upset. Mm-hmm. You know, like other people. Other people were pissed because yeah. of like you know the the him breaking the throne. You know, or him saying certain things about about the company. Right. I get all of that, but at the end of the day, it's a business. And if yeah. a company is offering you you seven figures a year, you're gonna you're gonna pick the best deal, no matter what. Yeah. But people could say yeah. what they what they people could say what they want. Until you're in that position, then you could then then you will understand why he did what he did. Mm-hmm. But I think more so now, I think it's about his legacy. He wants to he wants to be a WWE champion, and honestly, he's in the best position to become a WWE champion because. The last six years, he built up his stock for this moment, and that's what yeah. he did. So I can't, I can't be upset at him about that. You know, it's his choice. You know, he has to live with it. You know, I think me personally, I think he made the best decision for himself. But also, if you think about it, he made the best decision for 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 everything wrestling. If you think about it, because yeah. when he was in when he was in AEW, right, he had fantastic matches. Nobody is disc- discrediting him that. But the problem that Cody got into, and, he, and he's admitted it himself, is that he shot himself in the foot when it came to like, oh, I'm never going to go after the AEW title if I lose this, lose this match. Yep. That's where he kind of, that's where he shot himself in the foot. And then also, you know, him felt like, he kind of felt like he was gatekeeping new talent. So every time a new yep. talent would come in, he was their first opponent. He didn't want to keep doing that. And he said he felt like he was holding people back by doing that. So it's not like he was doing that on purpose. Like, you know, he yeah. knew he, you know, he he knew people were bothered by it. And he was like, you know, I'll try to do this. And people still booed. Like he, you know, yeah. he, you know, of course it bothered him a little bit, you know, but he understood the frustration. And I think for him, I think me for him personally, he made the best decision when it comes to going off from WWE. The other talent have a, have a chance to you know being pushed you know going up the ladder themselves because that was something he couldn't do, you know. Yeah. He said himself, "Hey, you know, I, I don't want to be a ten time TNT champion, you know, and that's the only that was a that was the highest thing he could reach because yeah. he made that stipulation because he want he wanted to be like you said like uh, he didn't want to be WWE." Yeah. WWE, you already know they made that kind of stipulation. Six months later, it will be like it's forgotten. Wait a minute, this person said he wasn't going to go for the title again, and yeah. then all of a sudden he's going for the title again. So yeah. you know he didn't want to do that. He didn't. He did. He did. You know he wanted to stick to his word, but by him doing that, that kind of really hurt his uh, development within all elite wrestling. So by yeah. him leaving, I think that's why it ended up being the best decision for him. Yeah, I was, you know, I'll be the first to admit I was one of those people that was like, oh, there's news that Cody Rhodes going back to WWE. I'm not excited for it. And I'll be the first to I'll be the first to admit it. But I will. But I'll also say that I I tuned into Monday nights to watch Cody after that (laughs) WrestleMania appearance with him and Seth. I was like, this is what we wanted. This is what I wanted. This is the Cody Rhodes I wanted in AEW. The dude was putting bangers on left and right. And then and then I think when he started when he started his feud with with uh Andrade, that's when I was like, eh. mm. you know, a lot of people said that. And I think that was the problem because uh he he kept being that person, that main person, hey, new new guy in the company, first yeah. feud, Cody Rhodes, Malachi yeah. Black, new guy in the company, first feud, Malachi yeah. Black. Yeah, and um, it sucked, man. It it was honestly, man, it was tough seeing it because I'm like, I'm such a big Cody fan, yeah. so seeing fans like giving him the John Cena treatment, it sucked because I'm like, he's not doing this on purpose, 
he's yeah. still putting on great performances. So to see that, it, it was pretty tough. You know, it, it yeah, wasn't I, really fun to see. I think I think like watching, like going back and and really watching it. You know, when guys would come in the company and he would he they would be his or he would be their first opponent. I felt like it hurt him in a way. You know, yeah, because it, like he's 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 you know he's he's uh he's got this stock that he built up and then he starts feuding with these with these guys coming in kind of like the gatekeeper role right um but he's losing and he's consistently losing to put guys over but that's not doing anything for him at all and then people are like oh why don't you turn heel well that's not always the answer it's not always the answer and that's what people are looking at like with john cena is like is like seen for the longest time i i've begged for a cena turn I was like, come on, man. Come on, please, please bring back the Dr. Thugonomics. Do something different because I want to like you. I want to enjoy your work. I love his matches, but I don't enjoy the character work, you know? And, uh, but a heel turn is not always, not always. It's not wired. Yeah. It's not, yeah, not only that, but it's it's, sometimes it's not a good thing. It's not business smart. Yeah, especially for somebody with John Cena. John Cena was in a position where he was the face of the guy. I mean, mm-hmm. of the company. He was the big, you know, he was the guy of the company. And I think in a in a one in a, in a in a way, he still is, no matter what. I think people could say, "Hey, Roman is," but in a way, it's still John Cena. John Cena's face is still out there. You know, they even doing this big month for him, like, "Hey, his 20th anniversary." As long as John Cena is still connected with WWE, I still think he's the top guy. I mean, yeah. in that sense of like representing the whole brand. Um, yeah. Does Roman have the potential to be that? Yeah. And I think they're trying to do that with Roman. Um, for the most part, they've done a decent job, I would say, with that. But the problem now, like I said, he has a, he has a two titles and he hasn't been on TV. He hasn't been yeah. used until, until this past Friday. Yeah. Um, but also his, if you if you think about it, his quality of matches have kind of declined because of that. You know, he's having this historic run. You know, he's about to be two years in until his until his title reign. You know, until his universal title reign. Yeah. Right. And um, his quality of matches have kind of declined because they want him to do that main event style yeah. of. Of WWE that they you know they want you to work the first few minutes and then you know you get out the ring you know you pace yourself and then have that big strong finish the last ten minutes that's the WWE style of main eventing and you know yeah. he he's going to into that even though I think at times it has hurt him but mm-hmm. you know that's what, they're, that's what they're doing with him now you know yeah but but like I said like with John Cena you know I still think he's the top guy and when it comes to like representing the whole entire WWE brand, he's still the top guy, no matter what. Um, but yeah, when he was getting that treatment, man, when Cody was getting that kind of treatment, I was like, fuck, like, damn, you know, yeah. Cody's trying to do everything possible to like, you know, put over guys. Because honestly, even when he was putting over guys, you know, he was still putting them over even when he was winning. So like when he yeah. was TNT champion, Right, he put over Ricky Starks, and Ricky Starks has such a good, uh, has such good feedback. It got Ricky Starks signed after the match. Eddie Kingston came in on, on, you know, same thing, no contract. Feedback was great after the match. Eddie Kingston gets a contract, so I think, you know, and remember, none of those guys won the match. So yeah. even. Well, there was times where guys didn't really need to win, and he was still putting them over. But I think, but because people had that mindset of like, "Oh, he's being Triple H," yeah. people didn't see that. People weren't rec- really recognizing that, and I think that's kind of the problem too with, with fans, where they think this person needs to win this to be, you know, they need to be champion to, you know, to be over with fans. You know, they need this, they need that. Sometimes that's yeah. not always that's not always the case. Sometimes. A wrestler could be so over that they don't need a title. Yeah. Sometimes they're even bigger than the champion themselves. So sometimes yeah. it's not even needed. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. And for what one second, one second. I just Eddie fucking Kingston. <laughs> I so I was never exposed to him 
up until probably two or three years ago. Maybe right before he made an appearance, that, that appearance against Cody. And somebody, I was like, who is this guy? I've heard his name before, but I've never seen him. And one of my buddies was like, you got to watch his promos. I was like, okay, well. But then I started thinking about it. I was like, okay, dudes, dudes that are in the ring that are okay in the ring, but like phenomenal promos. Bray Wyatt, boom, my first one. I was like, I love Bray Wyatt. Okay, well, I'm going to check this dude out. God, fucking damn it, dude. Eddie Kingston, and I watched this on Being the Elite. Eddie can cut a promo on anything and anybody. It doesn't even matter. I watched him do it on a cookie and then on a bag of candy. And I was like, this dude is a genius. And then and then I started diving deeper, and I seen where he cut the promo on, on you know, I hate creating stars when he beat the piss out of Ilya Dragunov. And then yeah. – uh, and then in NWA when he was talking about about homicide, and I was just like, "That was some of his best work." I think I think the NWA pretty much really exposed him to yeah. see like, "Oh shit, this is Eddie Kingston." Yeah, I think my the funny the the best thing, and, and anybody who says, "Oh, who's Eddie Kingston?" I, I send him, I send him the "I hate creating stars" where he just kept DDT and Ilya Dragunov, and, and like the funny thing was is he like, "Oh, you don't want to you don't want to stop DDT," okay, and then he goes on, and he's like. Oh, you're still moving? DDT. And that is the funniest shit to me. But Eddie Kingston, I cannot get enough of that dude. And I love him. And and he may never be world champion in AEW. But to me, like he's one of the best people on, on that roster, 100%. And he's transparent about uh, in his promos about his mental health and about how it's declined. And then how how he suffered in, you know, um, and being homeless and, and, and selling his ring gear. And I was like, that is amazing because he's actually like bringing he, he's breaking kayfabe to to create kayfabe and i'm like oh jesus this is crazy yeah he's always been good with that like um uh, with me like i i when i got exposed to Ed, eddie kingston like when i saw him in person uh unfortunately the times that i saw him he wasn't really cutting promos because it was just matches so like when I used to see his matches, I was like, "Wow, like this guy is pretty solid. Like he move, he, he yeah. moves really, really good in the ring for someone like his physique, someone his size." Yeah. yeah. So I remember the first, like I think one of the times, one of the one of the matches I saw is that he faced, they faced Mustache Mountain. It was a progress show that was in Queens, and he faced Mustache Mountain. It was him. I'm trying to remember the other guy, and it was Brody King, and they faced mm. Mustache. So it was it was they faced Pete Dunn, uh Tyler Bate, Trent Seven, right? That was like probably one of the best matches I've ever seen live. Like, especially for a six man tag, that was freaking yeah. that was insane. And I remember he took it was AR uh, Fox. Yeah. Was it AR Fox that uh, was with him? Was it AR Fox? I think he was on the show. I'm trying to remember. Okay. I'm trying to remember. I remember I know it was Kingston and it was uh Brody King. Yeah. That was like yeah. So and then I remember um he took there was a there was a Tyler Bates finisher mm-hmm. that he kind of does like the uh, what do you call that? The tiger driver. Yeah. yeah. So he did that to Eddie Kingston, right? But because freaking Eddie Kingston is so freaking big, the way he's landed, everyone was like, Holy shit, he just fucking cracked his head open, right? Yeah. We're like, oh man, like that was a nasty, that was a nasty fall. But I think when they, when I saw a replay of it, the freaking Eddie, if if you see what Eddie Kingston did, he saved his own life because he like stuck his like shoulder out a little bit more. And if it Mm -hmm. wasn't for that, Eddie Kingston would have broken, broken his neck. So. That tells you too, like he's smart in the ring. He's a ring general for a reason. No matter what people yeah. want to say, you know, of course, you know, his people are gonna talk about his promos. Like that's his, yeah. you know, that's the go-to. But he's yeah. actually not a bad wrestler. He's a good worker, you know. His style works. His style out, you know, it's sh- it's shown. His, his matches mm-hmm. with Moxley, his match with Punk, yeah. you know, which I hope they run that back. You know, once once Punk comes back, you know, I think that would be another great matchup. Um, his match with Jericho, like he's had he's had good matches. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Even this last one that he had with, with Hager, which I'm actually like really impressed because Hager really doesn't go the distance. Yeah. At all. <laughs> and he, and, and him and Eddie went the distance and I was like, man, this, wow. Wow. This is a good match. <laughs> like I, so, so for me, I usually, I'll put wrestling on and I'll sit there and watch it, but I'll check my social media, especially now I got a lot going on. And I was just like, all right, phones down. I'm watching because <laughs> for me, it's like it's like there's there's a few people that I'll sit down. I'll put my phone down. And I'll watch their stuff. Eddie Kingston is one of them. Like hands down, I'll put my I'll put my phone down, be done um, and, and just let that let it go because uh, I really enjoy Eddie's work. Um, but yeah, man. Uh, so when did when did you start, you know, when, when did you start uh, kind of falling in love with professional wrestling? Um. When I started falling in love, I wanted to say during my later years, more so. Um, when I was younger, I knew it was something that was always on. Um, wrestling was always on TV, so it was something that I always got like interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like I remember young, I remember seeing like uh Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, uh, Vader. That was he was always one of the guys that stuck out to me because of his mask, he just had a unique yeah. look. Um, the Undertaker, you know, being younger, I always thought the Undertaker was actually dead. So <laughs> that was pretty funny. Um, but um, yeah, so like, I've always been a fan of it. I was always a fan being younger. I remember I did have those periods where I got away from it. I want to say after, um, I want to say a little before the sale happened. Oh, no, I want to say after WrestleMania, the one where Austin and McMahon joined joined forces, 19. I kind of stopped. Yeah, I kind of stopped watching wrestling a little bit after that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't remember why, but I know I got away from it a little bit. And then I kind of came back to watching it right before WCW sold to um, WWE. So... I started following again ever since. I started following it again. Um, I want to say I fell in love with it um, more recently, maybe like 2013, to say like, wow, like I really love wrestling. Mm -hmm. And this was more because, uh, you know, I started going to shows more. I started like meeting people more. I started meeting the wrestlers more. Um, hard to believe the first person I met, no one will probably get this. But the first person, the first wrestler I met was probably AJ Lee. That was probably the first oh, wow. person. So, like, um, being younger, you know, I never was fortunate to go to a wrestling show because, mm -hmm. like, since my dad wasn't really a fan, we never really went. So, when I got older, I started doing things I wanted to enjoy. So, I started going to wrestling shows. Then I found it, then I started finding out about, like, oh, you could actually meet them. Like, if they do certain events, you could could meet them if you you know you just got to pay to meet them and mm -hmm. she was she was the first person i actually met um which was actually a very nice like uh interaction it was very it was one of those things like wow i think i'm gonna start doing this a lot more so that's how i actually started picking it up like that's how i actually started meeting new people we started you know doing all that stuff um when it comes to the artwork um i started when i started doing the artwork so like started drawing and actually getting them signed mm -hmm. it was probably 2014 that's when i started mm -hmm. doing it um the first person i met doing that it wasn't even a wrestler it was uh jason david frank uh, nice. the Green Ranger. so he was actually the first person i met when i did that one of the inspirations to that because people asked me like oh like what make you know what made you decide to do that so one of the things that actually made me decide to do that was um, when I actually started going to conventions, when I started going to like comic cons and all this stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So my first New York comic con that I went to was in 2011. Mm -hmm. So like, that's when I actually started, seeing, like when I started having that mindset, like I started seeing like artists, Oh, you could be an artist and you know you could sell your work here you know you could do copies of your work people could buy it right so i was always so yeah. i was pretty fascinated by that because i was like wow like 
I didn't think people would do it. I didn't know people could do this. And um, so like a little, I want to say around 2013, there was a guy that caught my attention. His name is uh, Corey Smith. And he does like these big, he does like these big pieces. Like he does like portraits Mm -hmm. and everything hand drawn, freaking phenomenal stuff. Like I was freaking blown away because I'm like, damn, I can't, I can't believe somebody actually do stuff like this. Yeah. Right. Everything was Mm -hmm. so detailed, everything. Right. And he had that unique style. Like I remember my first piece I bought from him. Right. He did a Bane piece. Right. Mm-hmm. It was Bane, and I think it was a Loki, right? So I was like, oh, I'll buy those two, right? And he's like, oh, um, you want me to color in the eyes? And I was like, yeah, sure. I was like, that's pretty cool. And he colored in, like, free of charge. He'll color in, like, the eye colors. So he did that. And I was like, wow, like, that's pretty cool. And I started looking at his portfolio, right? He had, like, he has, like, this big portfolio. His, like the sizes that he uses, he does pieces that are like 18 by 24. So they're like posters. So they're like poster size pieces, like he does. So I'm like, I'm looking through his book, right? And I noticed that some of his work were signed. And I was like, oh, are these signed by the actual actors? He was like, yeah. He he was like that. He he was like, depending on the shows that he works at, if they're there, he gets them autographed. He gets to meet them. He take, and he showed me some of his pictures. Like he's meeting the actors and holding. He holds it up, and they freaking love it, right? Mm-hmm. So that was that was probably my biggest inspiration to that. That I was like, wow, I think that would be pretty cool, because what ended up happening was that the year after, like when I met Jason David Frank, right? It was the first time I decided to attend the same show, but for four days. So I wanted to do something big. I'm like, damn, like, you know, what what can I do that's going to be fun? You know, like, what's going to be cool? You know, if I'm going to meet this person, like, what do I get signed, right? Mm -hmm. I really didn't have stuff. Like, I'll have to buy stuff, like, on the internet or something. But I'm like, what what can I do that would make me stand out? So that came to mind. Like, maybe I could get my artwork signed. You know, maybe that would do something. And because of that, that actually, that's what kind of caught the attention of a lot of people. When they started, yeah. seeing, when they started seeing, I started meeting people. And then even when I met Jason David Frank, he actually recorded the video. He actually did a recording of it. So it's, I think it's still somewhere, like on his page. Like he still has it. So because of that weekend, I think I did a few more people that weekend too. I was mm-hmm. like, all right, this is something I think I'm going to stick to. And ever since then, eight years, nine years later, I, I still, I'm still doing it because it's one of those things that you know it's fun for me. It's it's really fun. Um, not a lot of people do it, you know. Yeah. It's those things that it's very unique. Um, but also, it even built up my portfolio. So you know, that's always a fun part. And people see that, like, oh, you met, like, oh, you got this autograph by them, like, yeah. So like that's always been the fun part to me. Oh yeah, definitely. And and you know, it's pretty cool because like not only are you getting that interaction, but you're starting to I, I don't know if, if you've had this this uh this realization, but sometimes we put like celebrities on a pedestal and we're like, Oh man, they're boom. But it really breaks it down to a human level at that point when you go to meet them and they they're like, Oh shit, this is awesome. You, you start to view them as human beings and and not as as these untouchable people. Yeah, that's always been like probably the best reaction to that because they see it. They're like some people, some of them, they can't believe some of them are like, wow, like you took your time to do this. Like, that's pretty awesome. Like, I've had yeah. a few of that. I've had a, a few. I've had a few like there's few of them that freaking stick out like. uh 2018, like I met uh Felicity Jones. So she's um she's um Jen Urso in uh Star Wars Rogue One. Mm-hmm. And she was like one of the first, she was one of the first um people I met from the Star Wars franchise. So that was pretty cool. And I remember when I when I met her, I did a I did an art piece, she signed it, right? There was a shirt that I was actually selling that it was actually her. It was a design. I think it was from the 
remember the 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 Obama sign that there was like yeah. an art piece that had that. So I've always liked that style. Mm -hmm. So I what I did was that I collaborated with somebody else who fixed it up. So I mm -hmm. actually did her face on that design. So I end up I ended up getting that uh printed out on a shirt and I gave it to her, right? And she freaking loved it. She was like, she couldn't yes. believe it. She freaking loved it. And then uh, you're talking about the the poster that's half red, half blue. Yeah, that one. Yep. Yeah, I always love that style too. And then um, so so like the background, so like the 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 person herself, I drew. So mm -hmm. like I had somebody else to clean up the background and actually do it. So I ended up coming out freaking. Not, it came out sick, and mm -hmm. um, I had it I had it on a shirt, and I actually gave her the shirt, and she freaking loved it. I remember that one. Uh, which what else? Uh, Stan Lee's last appearance at, at New York Comic Con. I did a a blank cover of Spider Man, the Amazing Spider Man. There was a blank cover that I drew him on. Mm -hmm. I drew the what was it? The Homecoming look, the costume he wore in in um, Spider Man Homecoming. I I mm -hmm. sketched that out, and Stan Lee signed it. Right, so his mm -hmm. representative tells him. Because he, he looks at the cover, right? So, like, when I met Stan Lee, uh, him being older, he was already, like, in his 90s. He was, he was having he was having hard time seeing. Mm -hmm. So, some people were telling him. So, people had to ask us, like, oh, where do you want to sign it at? Because he has a hard time seeing. So, mm -hmm. we point, he's going he's gonna to sign it. He's going to sign it there, right? And I was like, oh, he could sign it right here. It's, it's no, um, he could sign it right here. It's no problem, right? Mm -hmm. So he looks at it, right? He sees it. He looks at it, and he right. He sees the Spider Man, right? Mm -hmm. And I hear, he's like this. He he's like, um, wow, this is a nice cover. Where's this from? I've never seen this before, right? Mm -hmm. And then I told him that his representative was next to him. He had to get close to him because he also was having issues hearing. Mm -hmm. And his representative tells him like, oh, that's actually his. He drew it on the cover. So he's like, wow. He he and then he tells me, "Wow, you have some great talent, kid. Like, I hope you really stick with it." So, like, you know, how can you beat that, right? <laughs> that that is like on top of the mountain right there. <laughs> so, like, that is insane. Yeah. So, like, man, like that was a uh, that was like that's definitely like a top moment for me. I I even so what I do now in my my in my in my artist appearances for some of these convention appearances I do, I actually keep the photo in the back that I met him. Mm -hmm. So when people see it, they're like, holy shit, you met Stan Lee. <laughs> because um, the cover that I actually got autographed, I got it scanned and I actually sell that at shows. So like the, so the printout of that, of that cover, I get signed. But the cool, coolest part about it is that since he already signed it, you also get that with it. So it looks like it looks like a Stanley autograph on it. So usually when I get people to add, like when they ask me, like they they know it's a copy. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, like the original, did he really sign it? I was like, yeah. I was like, that was the cover I got signed by him. So when they see the picture, that's when they put two to two together. Like, wow, like you actually met him. <laughs> That is super awesome. I remember seeing that picture too when you met him. And, and to me, that was like, holy shit. That's the holy grail. <laughs> you know, a lot of people was telling me that. <laughs> and what happened was how, how that made it what what made that crazy too was that um he was actually only supposed to be, do three days. So what happened was like I knew I was gonna get his autograph. I just didn't know I was gonna meet, I was gonna take I was gonna get a photo out. So that was the only thing. For me, that I was like, all right, I'm gonna get his autograph. That's all that's gonna matter to me, right? Mm -hmm. What ends up happening was that they announced I'm at work. And the reason why I remember this is because I was on it like like this. Yeah. I was at work, and that's when they they, they announced uh near Comic Con, they announced like, oh, that Stan Lee will be there all four days. So if you want his photo op, um, they're available now. As soon as I saw that, I was like, "All right, I'm not missing this shit." Went yeah. on, and getting the photo op, I was like, "All right, 
that's it. it the price didn't matter to me i was like yo i'm meeting him i don't care at this point <laughs> that's it like that's gonna be my 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 highlight of that weekend that that's that's fucking awesome man that's super cool <laughs> like that like that alone like that alone it, it it's like can you get better than that like does it get better i don't think it does you met, <laughs> you met the man stan right. lee himself and you, know, he, yeah, you know it's crazy too like when you when, when you say that too because um sometimes i always ask myself that sometimes too it's like how, how you know how can you you know what what can you do next right yeah. So because I've been doing this for so long, it's one of those things like sometimes you get worried about like, oh, is it going to get stale or are you just not going to enjoy it as much anymore? Thankfully for me, thank, thankfully for me, I'm still enjoying it. I still love what I, what I do. I still I still love like interacting with people like that. Um, yeah. If I do an art piece um, and they love it, you know, that's, you know, for me, that that keeps me going. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you do that, you become an inspiration for other people, man. Like, like how, how, how does it feel like when somebody comes up and they say, man, you inspired me to, to start drawing again or, or to do this or do that. How does that feel? Uh, for the most part, I actually feel surreal because like the reason why, you know, when I started taking my art seriously, it was it was one of those things like you know, you're doing it for yourself for the most part, right? Because it's coming yeah. for you. It's, it's coming from you. So sometimes you don't realize how much it means to others. Like when they see it, sometimes you don't realize it. Even sometimes, even now, like it's still sometimes it's still hard to believe because all I'm doing is just you know I you know I'm just doing what I enjoy. So when I hear that from other people, you know that's you know that's that's the best part of everything. You know, because yeah. I still, it's even to this day, man, like, like this past weekend, you know, like the last weekend when I did my, 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 my artist appearance, I had a few people, like one guy came from like Connecticut. Another guy came, I think it was from Virginia. He was oh, like, wow. that came up there just to see me. And I'm like, me, like, just me. I'm like, because it's one of those things. It's like, you can't believe it. It's like. I'm just a regular guy, you know. <laughs> That's how I yeah. feel. Like I'm just a regular guy who's, you know, enjoying what he's doing. But then like when you when you start to hear like their stories or where they're what where where they come from, then you start to understand like wow, like what I do is not only for me, but it's for a lot of people who look for inspiration to doing something or getting back to doing something. Cause I've gotten that a lot. Like that's one of the things like I didn't realize either. Like when people say, Oh, you know, he draws and he stopped doing it and he wants to get back to it. And there was even a few people that came up to me and they said, they started doing it again because of me. Yeah. Cause they see like how good I got. And then meeting all these people, you know, they, you know, they couldn't, you know, when, when I hear stuff like that, you know, that's, you know, it's it's crazy. It's still it's still one of those things like it's hard to say, like put into words. Yeah. Just because like you just don't expect it at all. Yeah. And, and that's that's absolutely astounding, man. Like to have people come and see you uh from states away, um, and, and then just being like you inspired me and you you know, being able to listen to their stories, man. Um, like I get people, I live in Alaska, I get people from all over the country, um, on the show and, and just to hear their stories is humbling. And, and I really, I really enjoy it. Like hearing your story is humbling. I got people from all over the place and it's, and it's humbling to see where they, where they came from and what they're doing now. And that's the whole purpose of this show, where they came from, what they're doing now and, and how they're inspiring other people. It's just awesome. One of the other, one of the other people that you met that i'm like wow Derek jeter oh <laughs> i i i grew up watching jeter on tv and he was my the very first baseball player i ever like seen on a baseball cover on sports illustrated and 
I wa- my very first game was was Boston and the Reds or the Red Sox and the Yankees and, and uh and, and game seven of the World Series in ninety seven. And my dad was like, You're gonna be a Yankees fan, and, and that's the end of it. And I was like, All right, cool. And I, I picked one person, it was Jeter, and, and the only reason I picked it was because I seen him on a on a cover of 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 Sports Illustrated. And and then it just became this like obsession. I was like, I fucking love Derek Jeter. I love Derek Jeter. Like, like I don't care about anybody else. Jorge Posada, don't care about him. You know, don't don't care about CC Sabathia as long as I see Derek Jeter play. That's all that matters. Then I start collecting his cards and stuff. And like, yeah. So when when I see that you you met Jeter, I was like, oh, I'm so envious. <laughs> I am so envious. I met him a few times. You know, I was yeah. very. Very lucky to meet him when I did because it was at the, it was actually at the stadium. It was actually at Yankee Stadium. So like the old Yankee Stadium, they used to have this walkway, so fans could wait outside. They had a barricade. Mm-hmm. They never had the gates. You know, they never had the. They always had gates there. So sometimes you'll be lucky to you could always see them coming in, mm-hmm. but for them to stop and, and sign certain stuff like it'll. Sometimes it's a little hard sometimes because sometimes they don't always stop. So the so I was I've been fortunate twice that he stopped and I got to meet him. And this was when I was a kid. So like the first time I met him, I got my it was a base it was a team baseball that I got signed by him. That was the first time I met him. And then the second time, um, I got uh, I had a baseball card and I got that one signed. And then um. And then recently, somebody saw, like, oh, yeah, you're a big Derek Jeter fan, right? And I was like, yeah. Like, uh, oh, I have some photos signed by him. You know, I don't, you know, I'm moving out. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff getting rid of. Do you want it? So I was like, um, <laughs> let me take a look at it. Like, I want to make sure it's real, right? Yeah. And I see it, it was real. Like, had it had the certs. I had everything. I was like, all right, cool. I'll, uh, I'll take it. And it's crazy because now, if I was to meet Derek Jeter again, like it'll still feel like it'll be like the first time I met him. Like that's yeah. how I that's that's how I feel about Derek Jeter, and he's still one of those guys that I'm like, I for my collection because I, I collect a lot of like autographed baseballs. He's still one of the guys I'm like, all right, I have to have him. I don't know when, I don't know how, but he's a guy that I need to have in my collection. Even though now, like if I was try, if I was to try to buy it now, I mean he's he's pretty expensive, but it's one of those things. I'm like maybe down the line, I'm like I'm gonna have to like say like, hey, this is worth it, and I'll buy it. But he's a tough one to get. He's very very tough. But uh, from what I know too, he's very professional. Um, one of my buddies has gotten to work with him when it comes mm-hmm. to like private signings and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And this was our, this was the time where he was still working with the Marlins and he was still like working with people. He was still doing private signings. He was still, you know, he's very professional. I was surprised. I was like, wow, like he still has time to do all that stuff. You know, it's just like, you no, know, now, unfortunately he's not, he doesn't work with the Marlins anymore. He got away from it, but mm-hmm. I don't think he cares. I, I mean, I think he cares because he wanted to own the team. Yeah. That's where it came down to. He really wanted to do something different. I felt like with the Marlins, he was. He made some nice moves. The Marlins are actually pretty decent for what they are, and mm-hmm. that's because, and that's because of the moves Derek Jeter was making. So I think yeah. you know, there's a part of it too that he cares because at the end of the day, I think what what got to him too, what got to Jeter, was that um the difference between the owners and the players being an owner and the player, you know, when you, when you, the lockout, I think that's what got to him too, the lockout yeah. because you had this friction between, between players and um, owners that everyone wants to make the most money that they can, you know, and, you know, yeah. these guys are trying to up, you know, undercut a lot of players. Jeter being a former player, he know how, he knows how that feels. He knows that position. I'm pretty sure that bothered him a lot. Too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Jeter is the goat. <laughs> Jeter is the goat. But yeah, I mean, you know, I grew up a Yankees fan and and any any time the Yankees were on, 
where I, where I, wherever I, w- I lived, I turned it on. It was, I was watching it and damn it. I, I even, when I was older, I went and bought a, a Jeter Jersey and it, it, it's, it's in my closet now. And I, I absolutely, yeah, yeah. I don't think there's another player in professional baseball that I, or, you know, MLB that I'm like, I'm a bigger fan of the Jeter <laughs> uh, <laughs> at all, but yeah. Um, okay. let Real quick, let, let's talk about True Heels. How did that? How did that uh, come about? Oh, True Heels. Uh, that came about with. Uh, that's actually Sid's brand. So mm-hmm. what happened was that I, I know Sid. Was, he's been running the the brand for about a few, like maybe about two or three years before I came along. So the funniest story about like my interaction with Sid the first time. It actually had to do with Cody Rhodes. <laughs> <laughs> Cody Sid, brings everybody together. You no, know, but you know what's funny though is that uh Sid wasn't very fond of, of Cody Rhodes. Yeah. I didn't know that, right? Mm-hmm. So I remember like Sid goes on this rant. He's like, fuck Cody Rhodes, right? <laughs> and I was like, I was like, hey, you know, I never had a problem with Cody. Like, he's always been nice with me. And he was like, Oh, that's good. But fuck him anyway. I don't give a shit, right? I'm like, oh. I'm like, I'm like, whoa, like, where's this hostility coming from, right? Yeah. So then he like keeps he keeps going, right? And I'm like, all right, cool. Like, you want to go? You want to do this? All right, let's do this, right? So then me and him start going back and forth, right? And at that point, I was just trolling the shit out of him, right? <laughs> yeah. So yo, it, it went like maybe like freaking like 30 or 40 comments long like i didn't realize how how long we were going back and forth i was like holy shit right mm-hmm. and i was like man what this guy right so yeah. this was in i'm talking about it was one of the wrestling group so like at that time it was kind of like oh like the fuck is wrong with this guy right <laughs> but then yeah. like a couple of times we'll get into it right so remind, and that's what made it funny. It was like it's like at first, me and Sid were not cool, and it was because of that, right? But <laughs> yeah. then when we started becoming cool, what made it funny was that the reason why we actually started becoming cool is because there was a debate going on, and I remember I remember I made a comment, and he saw how much I knew about wrestling. Like he saw, like he was like, "Oh shit!" Like. He's pretty. He's actually pretty good with like his uh, some of his takes. Yeah, and this was when he actually saw I was being serious, right? So little by yeah. little, that's actually how we became cool. And I think it was around 2018. 2018, we we were in a group chat with a bunch of us. There's a bunch of people that some of us to this day, you know, we're still cool. So a lot of like you know, there was a friction between certain other people that we you know we're not. Um, affiliated with anymore but what happened was that when I started becoming more cool with Sid because I started seeing how Sid is and how he takes things seriously when it comes to like branding or you know just having overall integrity of what you're doing because I think that's always important right and I'm gonna get into that a little bit but Mm How, they, how he'll take certain things serious when it came to his brand, right? So when I joined the True Heels group, right, I saw, I saw, I saw he, I saw it had potential. So like, True Heels, they were ran a certain way at that time. They were they were ran a certain way, which is like, hey, it's cool, you know, it's fine, but I think it could be better. So once once I volunteered and I was like, hey, you know. Can I, you know, I don't mind joining the group, right? At first, it was kind of like a joke. I was kind of like doing like one of those things as like a joke. Like, hey, mm-hmm. you know, make me an admin or like, you know, I'm an advocate, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, like, it became like the serious thing where Sid actually started considering it, right? So mm-hmm. apparently he had like a, he had like a talk with like a few of his guys. Like, hey, can we join? Can we have him join, right? So one person mm-hmm. had a little concern. He was like, oh, you know, I don't want him to, like, get too crazy sometimes with some of these people they, when they get crazy, right? Yeah. But they saw, like, how I would handle it, right? So when they started yeah. seeing it little by little, that's when I actually started. That's when I actually joined True Heels. Like, yeah. actually, 
as in being the actual brand, not just the group, but to be mm-hmm. part of the brand to actually help them to do stuff like that. And I think where it actually started becoming bigger when it when it came to like being more serious when um when Sid, you know, he was doing his podcast, you know, mm-hmm. when he started doing his podcast, right? Um, you know, just like anything else that you try to start, it takes time. Everything, everything takes time. So yeah. how we got closer as a not only a brand, but as in friends, was like, like I said, the friction that we had with certain people from another from another group. Um there was a there was a there was a there was an obvious problem going on. And the problem is that some someone like me, someone like Sid would speak up, right? We wouldn't hold back on it. We were like, hey, obviously there's something wrong. Let's speak about it. So that's one of the things that we kind of like, you know, when he saw when he saw I had his back, that's when things started yeah. becoming like more like serious, you know. Certain certain things that happened with him, certain ways that he was being treated, I didn't like. Because I'm like, hey, he's trying to do the best that he can. If he's helping you guys out, if he's helping out other brands, you know, why can't he why can't he have the same respect back? And that was always one of the problems I had seeing that. Because I was just like, you know, if he's helping you guys, why can't he get that? Why 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 he he can't get the same thing back? Yeah. So. So, so where it actually started becoming big was when when he took the um his YouTube channel, right? He asked somebody mm-hmm. else about like his YouTube channel, right? Somebody that he knew, somebody he's very close to. And they looked at his he wanted he wanted honest feedback, right? And that was that's always a good thing about Sid. Sid is very good with taking Honest feedback. Now, if you're just somebody that says, "Oh, your, you know, your 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 channel sucks," right? Yeah, you're gonna get the response that you're gonna get, right? Somebody's gonna, yeah, you know, somebody's gonna, yeah. you know, somebody's gonna is gonna shit on you, right? Too, right? They're gonna yeah. give it back to you. Cause that's not, you know, to to me, that's not that that's not criticism. Criticism is, yeah. Hey, I think you do this well, but where you struggle with is this, that, and I think you need to work on this. That's for criticism, right? Yeah. So absolutely. Apparently, so apparently he, he, um, asked this person, Hey, give me your honest opinion about my, about my YouTube channel. Right. He looks at it, views it. And he, and they, and they, the guy tells him, Hey, honestly, you could, you know, you could do way better than this. Right. Mm-hmm. He he was like you have the potential, and I think you know. And he he was like I don't think this is your best stuff. So once Sid actually like started taking his channel seriously, that's when everything started like everything started coming together. And um, once we got away, once 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 we got, we started being affiliated with that with, with that certain group, because I you know I want to mention them. They don't you know. They don't. They don't need more publicity than they already think they get. So once we got away from that, you know, knowing that we had fresher ideas, we had great ideas, and also we work as a team. You know, that's where everything started coming along, and even with that, like even that slow, steady pace, you know, we knew we could get there. And so yeah. far, like to to this date, like we've had such a big year that i don't even think we kind of expected that with with at least the the youtube channel like this year alone we've had over we've had a, almost 600 subscribers like just added nice you know we were, we we're about to hit you know we we're about 500 from 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 3000 uh we've had over 100 and we've had almost 120 thousand total views throughout the year um, we've had over 20 um, 1K plus videos. So that tells you like the amount of work that we've been putting in. And yeah. the reason why everything is working is because we work as a team. Nobody's bigger than the other person. And remind you, like Sid, Sid, Sid has, has been doing his thing. Like he's, you know, he's doing it, you know, he's with Wrestle Talk. 
He does the podcast with Sports Kita. He's on the mm-hmm. Fightful channel. He's so he's doing a lot, right? Yes. He he's doing a lot. But what's the good thing about him is that he's not making it, he's making none of it about himself. Yeah. Like you can really see it. Anybody, anybody can see it. And I'm not saying that just because you know I I'm you know I work with him. But if you really see it, like he's you know, because because believe me, there's guys that I've seen that I've met who are very e- egotistical. You know, they're very full of themselves. And then, you know, when they think they're getting the sex success that they're getting and it's really not what they think it is, um, you could you could see the ugly part of things. Yeah. What was said has never been like that. So it has never made anything bigger than himself because he knows it's a group. He knows it's a group effort. There's things that he knows he can't do that the other person can do. And he and, you know, he gives them more than enough credit for that. Because he's even said to himself, like, hey, if it's not for this person, we're not, we, you know, we can't do this together. We can't do this. And um, that's one of the great things about our brand that, you know, like I said, it's all a team effort. Like, yeah. when we talk about a team effort, when you talk about a team, like, none of us, not, none of us think we're bigger than the other. Because at the end of the day, we're all here for the same purpose. And, you know, that's, you know, giving content. You know, for for wrestling fans, you know, giving just our honest feedback on certain things, you know, a lot of people might not always want to agree, you know, that's fine. Hey, right. We have our opinions on things. Right. Yeah. And I, for me and even in general, for me, that's always how I've always been. Hey, when it comes to like wrestling, when it even comes to the other side of politics and stuff like that, you know, I try not to get involved in all that stuff because it's like at the end of the day, we have the right to feel how we feel no matter what. So if you like this person, you like that person, hey, you can you, you can like all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's always about how you present yourself. And if you present yourself like a dick, then people are going to give you shit for it. No matter what you think it's good, whatever you think it's right, whatever you think it's wrong, is always about how you present yourself. And I think when it comes to us representing our brand i think we've done more than enough to represent to represent ourselves in a matter that people are going to respect what we have to say when it comes to like wrestling when it comes to you know when it comes to giving content like that like if we think wwe hasn't been doing a good job we'll say why hasn't been doing a good job we're not going to say oh wwe sucks they don't do this or that right yeah or like when AEW has a bad show. We have no problem saying that. A, you know, they're not going to always have a great shows, and that's just that's human nature. Nothing is perfect, right? But I could I could give my honest opinion, and I'll say, hey, I've I've enjoyed AEW a lot more than WWE, mm-hmm. and I'll give yeah. my honest opinion why. You know, it's like with, with WWE, right? It's like when I watch WWE now, right? How about do I think it's gotten a little bit better? Yeah, some aspects. Can it be better? Absolutely. And it could be way better. Yeah. But there's certain things that believe me, there's certain things that they do that drives me nuts. And it's not even about the outside stuff that, that's going on with them. Right? Not, not even about the releases, because sometimes the releases is like, what's going on? Like, what yeah. what's this? Like, why is this person getting released? Right. Yeah. But if you look at like their product, right? One of the things that drives me nuts, and I tell people this all the time, is like when they book these storylines, right? When somebody has to face the champion to get a number one contenders match, right? It makes and no they, sense. And then they beat the champion, right, to get the title match, all right? And then the cha- to the champion wins, right? What drives me nuts about s- stuff like that is like. Why you gotta face the champion for a number one contenders match? All right, you're making you're making the champion look weak. Like there's no point of that because you're gonna have the champion lose. What's the and then even the number one contender, you're gonna have them look weak because it's like how is it they win the match but then they can't win the big one? So it's like it's a it's a it's a lose lose situation. Yeah, you you make your champion look like shit. The number one contender looks like trash. Yeah, so it's like what like. Stuff like that, you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. little things like that, and then like they're 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 uh they're 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 booking too. It's like when I mean, you get the same thing every week. Like there was that period of time where we got New Day 
and Sheamus and his crew for like 12 straight weeks on SmackDown. 12 straight yeah. weeks. The same interaction, 12 straight weeks. And unfortunately, that was during the period where Biggie broke his neck, right? Yep. And it's like, why why are we getting this? Right. And it's like they had the match at WrestleMania. And then it was still going after WrestleMania. Yeah. It's just things like that. You know what I mean? Like with WWE, it's like, why do you guys do this? Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> so- yeah. <laughs> um, but so so real quick about Sid, man. I I really, really respect the shit out of Sid. And I and I respect him because he's not one of those people. That if you voice your opinion, he's going to trash you for it. And like you said, it's presentation, how you present it. it. As long as you present it in a respectful manner and educated, he's not going to be like, well, fuck you. You know what I mean? Um, he's going he's, he's gonna to sit down and listen to your, your side and then tell you why he respectfully disagrees with you. He's, he's done that a lot with me. <laughs> and, and, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that because as a wrestling fan... And I'm pretty sure you can you can relate to this as a wrestling fan. We're not going to agree on everything, but the wrestling community is pretty goddamn toxic at times. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> believe me. There's a lot of times we we deal with that. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of things come into factor when it comes to that. I think Twitter comes into factor with that. Social yeah. media overall comes into a factor with that. Um, when you hear these stories about what certain fans are doing, um, when you hear like the the stalking or, you know, that incident with Sonya Deville or like when you hear fans are falling for like fake accounts, you know, these are things that, you know, they're very serious, you know, like that fan that jumped over the, 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 the the rating to beat up Seth Rollins. I know that guy. Right. And I saw this guy. I saw him when I met the undertaker back in March. Right. And he was Mm -hmm. like, he was on the next line waiting. And I was, I remember when I saw him, I was like so infuriated that he was online. And then he was trying to talk to me because he saw I was wearing the CM Punk sweater. Mm-hmm. So he wanted to say, like, oh, what's your favorite CM Punk match? Right. So I remember when he asked me that and I said to him, I don't know. I was like, I don't know. And I don't care. And I was yeah. more so because I didn't, I didn't want to talk to him because I didn't respect him. Because the fact that you want to go on social media and you and the thing was crazy, too, is that people actually believe this garbage, like the garbage that he was spewing, spewing about like, oh, Seth Rollins owes me two hundred and fifty dollars. You would think Seth Rollins is really going to hit you up for two hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. Are you kidding yeah. me? You know, he makes more than that appearing on Raw. So you really think he's going to need your money? The same guy who runs right. he runs two businesses outside of WWE. You think he needs two hundred and fifty dollars? That's your fault, man. You fell for that garbage. But even like overall, yep. like like you said, like the fan base being toxic. Like to me, it gets it gets so ridiculous when when people feel like they need to like pick sides. Like oh no, like you know, if you only like WWE, then you better only watch WWE. Or, like, yeah. same thing with AEW fans. You know, they tend to do that, too. But what I sometimes, you know, especially on Twitter, I try to stay away from that because some people always fall for this garbage narrative when it when it comes to stuff like that. Or, like, yeah. I've, I've, also, I've also never been a fan of, like, telling people, like, oh, you know, you should just enjoy all of wrestling. Why people can't just do that? Why people can't get along? At the end of the day, that. at the end of the day, you can like whatever you want. That's fine. You can like whatever you want. If you if you prefer WWE, that's fine. My thing is, is that I think what people need to start holding others or even themselves accountable for is like if something's not good, just say it. It's, there's no problem saying that the show that you like is not good. There's no problem with that. And sometimes I had to tell people that. I was like, if Raw was freaking bad, there's nothing wrong with people saying Raw was bad. But don't go attacking people because you like something that that people didn't like. It's going to happen, you know? There's there's yeah. times where I like the AW show that people didn't like, and I'm like, okay, like, what, what am I going to do about it? At the end of the day, I'm not getting paid by AEW. 
like there's nothing there's no there's there's no you know there's nothing that that's gonna come out of it but um yeah, yeah but like yeah man i think bigger part of it is like social media you know yeah. and social media could be a good and bad thing sometimes yeah i just think that sometimes people go overboard with, with stuff like that or like did you hear about the uh did you hear about the Liv Morgan situation? About the I've heard something. Oh, they got the guy sold his house. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah, like what? you sold you your house. I mean? Like, what well, you see what I mean? Like, what? Yeah. She 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 owns a farm with Bo Dallas. You think she needs right? your money? <laughs> right. Right. You know, that that's insane. But yeah, I mean, you said it, man. Social media can be a great thing, but can they also be terrible? And I think a lot of where we as fans get misconstrued is sometimes we read into things that don't need to be re read into. And then we're like, well, fuck him. But in reality, it's hard to tell like the emotion behind what's being said or the inflection in the voice and, and messages and not over, you know, like if, like if we're talking yeah. here and, and, and we, and you read our conversation, like on a manuscript, you'd be like, well, fuck them pieces of shit. You know what I mean? But if you're yeah. hearing the voice, you're hearing the conversation It's it's different. And that's what I really enjoy about like having, you know, interactions like this and, and, and stuff like that. But, you know, there is a level of, madness that i i do find in in fans and it's it's the fact that 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 we're you can't like what you like without being being targeted you know what i mean like for instance uh there's a whole like side of like wwe fandom on tiktok i'm pretty you know i do my tiktok thing and um i'd be like man dude just raw was unbearable this week i fell asleep <laughs> and they're like how could you not like raw and i'm like it's three hours long. Um, really wasn't that good this week. But there was one segment that was great that I really enjoyed. And they're like, yeah, but you're supposed to like all of it. Um, that's news no. to me. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking news to me, man. Yeah, I get. Yeah, there's sometimes when people do that, it's like, what? Like, Or like sometimes with WWE, too. I noticed with a lot of WWE fans, this is not a shot at WWE fans. Sometimes they tend to oversell things. And what I mean by that is, like, if WWE has, like, one great show, right, sometimes they act like nothing else ever happened, right? They have one great turnout. Oh, my God, this was, like, the best show of the year. Or, like, I was like, what? Like, calm, calm down. Like, let's let's calm down a little bit. What do you mean by that, right? So it's yeah. like, so, like, for example, like, the, the first night of WrestleMania, I thought it was great, mm -hmm. right? I thought it was fine. I thought it was. I, I thought it was pretty damn near perfect, to be honest with you, because they had that fantastic match, that fa fantastic women's title match with Bianca and Becky, and then you have the return of, return of Cody Rhodes, and like not not it's not only about his return, but it was every like if you really think about it, right? Not only Cody Rhodes was not advertised, right? So you didn't even know who was gonna come out, right? The way they yeah. did it, they had people wait, right? And then once you finally realize it's Cody Rhodes, he's freaking his American Nightmare gear, his logo, like everything. So it's there, it's like it's that freaking shock. It's like wow, he's yeah. there as himself, like he's there as American Nightmare, not not as dashing Cody Rhodes, not as Stardust. Yeah. He's there as the American Nightmare. So you can't freaking believe what's going on, right? And then mm -hmm. on top of that, they have a freaking damn near perfect match. That match was almost five stars. Yeah. Like the way both of those guys worked and then the storytelling that they did. And I think that's one of the things that Cody Rhodes, I forgot to add to, is that Cody Rhodes is probably the best storyteller in the business because he doesn't even need to do like all, you know, like all these crazy moves, all these flips. His storytelling pretty much speaks for itself, you know, yeah. and I think that's why, like, when I say, like, he's that WWE style, that's where it comes from, because you don't need yeah. to be that, you don't need to be, like, that crazy dynamite kid kind of style person oh, yeah. to be great, Um, so I think that helps him a lot, but, like, 
that match itself, like you see the storytelling within that match, the finish of that match, everything. And then, yeah, Stone Cold come back. Right. The way that I had no idea he was going to do what he did, like that long. And take bumps. And take and bumps. Take, he took that freaking bump on the concrete. So I remember. Yeah, we I was like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Yo, when we were watching that on the watch log, I said that I was like, "Yo, so you tell me the first bump that Stone Cold takes out of all these years when he was retired is on damn concrete." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was terrified. I was like, "Oh no!" But right? he, it was a fucking great match. Yeah. So like, night one ends up being great, right? Night two, not so much. Night two to me was like, it was, it was okay. It was n- nowhere near. What night one, what night one was, and the problem to, to me, right? Because I actually, I actually got like a small debate when I when we when we reviewed it mm-hmm. with a guy from the UK who covers WWE. He actually covers like he does like all that stuff. Yeah, so he called he covers mostly WWE. So I kind of knew he was gonna try to defend him in yeah. some way, shape, or form, right? So when it came to the whole physic man thing. Right, I didn't like none of it. I don't care what people say. I don't care what what people try to defend it with. I did not like it because that because one, it shouldn't have not been a, a match. Right, you could you could implement physical man. I don't mind that. That's not what I'm arguing. But the fact that you made it a match and then you see it the way that he freaking moved is like, did you really want to put this guy in this situation? There were so many ways you could have used Vince McMahon in a way that would have been, it wouldn't have been that bad. So the guy is like telling me like, oh, you know, this is why they did this and that. And I'm like, that's not what I'm disputing. I'm saying that it was just bad. It should never have happened. (laughs) Exactly. It should have never happened. Now, if you're going to use Vince McMahon, like I said before, you could use him in a way that didn't need to be a match. So of course people, of course you're gonna use, you know, Vince McMahon. He's gonna get more buzz than when they didn't put the Intercontinental Title match in WrestleMania. That I get, and that I could support because I understand the whole point of WrestleMania. And I've always been a big advocate of 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 that. Of like your biggest show, if you're gonna have your biggest show, you're gonna want the biggest things that the people are gonna talk about the most. So like when they had Bad Bunny last year. I didn't have a big problem with it because I knew what they were doing, right? Yeah. Now, you could disagree with it, right? My thing is like, hey, you, you could not like it, but you could understand it. Yeah. And when I came for that aspect, I understood it. doesn't mean I had to like it. I understood where they're coming from. And then Bad Bunny performed his ass off. He was great. Yeah, so I was like, I was impressed. Even, yeah, so like that even, that even made that situation better, right? But yeah. now it was bad, right? Say if if he was really terrible in the ring, right? That would have made it look even worse. That would have made the narrative of like, oh, you see, he should have never been out there. So like compared to like this this year, they had uh, Logan Paul, right? A lot of people don't like Logan Paul, right? I don't mind Logan Paul. I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't mind him. He doesn't bother me. Him and Jake Paul don't bother me, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's just my take on that. But Logan Paul did very well. He's an athlete. No matter what people want to say, he's an athlete, yeah. and he did well, right? So I understood mm-hmm. why they used him. And guess what? It got people talking. It got people talking on ESPN. It got people talking on yeah. TMZ. That's what yeah. WWE wants, right? Mm-hmm. Like again, you could you could not want that, but for a worldwide brand, that's what they're doing, and that's their target. Their target is entertainment. And so, the pop the. Yeah. The pop, the pop that Pat McAfee got. Woo! Oh yeah, that oh was crazy. God. That yeah. was crazy. But I think you know it's funny. I told people I was like, yo, I think it was more the song than the. the yeah. Actual- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody was singing it when they left the arena. You know. I think it was um, more the song, but like the whole thing with Vince, I did not like it. Yeah. And then he was like trying to def- try and defend it. He was like, oh, you know, it wasn't good. But I give a hot take. You know, I enjoy. I was like, what? I was just like, how can you enjoy something that's not good? I was like. And I told the guy that I was like, that doesn't make any sense. And he kind of no. like backtracked. He kind of backtracked what he said. I was <laughs> like, what? Yeah, the thing is, is, is there's no need for a 70 year old man to get in the ring and then 
pretty much squash a dude who's in his, the prime of his life who just had a fucking match at all. Like, like, I mean, I mean, and then not to mention you won the match by punting a football into his abs. Like, come on. This, I mean, like, like you said, you could have virtually done anything and it would have been better. Like you could have, Hey, no, uh, theory never lost the match because we're going to restart the match. Okay. That's understandable. Or, or, Hey, you know, get the hell out of, ring, out of my ring or have him, you know, he calls down another henchman to come down Austin and Fierce. but you could have done so much more instead of that. And I don't think I, I, I'd be okay. If I never saw Vince on TV again, I, I would be okay. If I never, if, if I never seen him step foot in a wrestling ring, I would be okay. If I never seen yeah, his you know, age, he, really, his age has been showing more and yeah. more, even with his voice. Like when he talks, it's starting to show more. And then what made it even worse is that he took the worst stunner of all time. Oh, oh. it was terrible. I know they're trying to relive that that's that shit, but it was terrible. He I mean he stumped yo, that heavy died though. He stumped I mean, the ropes. I, I, <laughs> yo. Out of everybody, he's always taken the worst stunners, and I've never understood that. Like you work in the company. I mean, maybe you're met, you're you're trying to make it look bad, but regardless, it looked terrible. I think the McMahon's. I think there's something about the McMahon's that don't they don't know how to take stunners because because like he took the worst stunner. Linda McMahon took a terrible <laughs> stunner. Yeah, Stephanie I think takes it very well. I think she she does very well. She does pretty decent. Shane. Finn, Shane, yeah, Shane is okay. Shane just throws the worst punches out there, yeah. but. Um, but uh, talking about the big man's, I don't know, man. They they don't know how to take stunning. Man. <laughs> I, I would, I mean, I would be happy if I never saw Vince or Shane on TV again or in a match. I love Shane. I love how he's a, how he's a daredevil, but they put him in unnecessary matches. Believe like me, I, mean, I, I feel the same way, hundred, and I've been feeling that way for a long time. I mean, you and didn't would, need to go into hell and cell with Undertaker. Yeah, like, yeah, like I, I don't care what people say about Shane. McMahon. I'm like. I don't care if he's likable. The guy's not a wrestler. At the end of the day, he's not a wrestler. If he's not yeah. jumping through something, he's not he's not exciting to watch. Like he's just not good. Like yeah, I'm like not, that's the next thing they're gonna, they have to ele the, the next stunt they have to elevate it. He's gonna have to fall from the rafters. Like <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna have to jump off of something from the rafters to make it like over the top. I would be happy yeah. if I never seen him again. But all right, man. So we're about to close the show. Uh, real quick, if you had to give advice or a suggestion to somebody that's kind of on the fence about doing what you do, about being, you know, an artist or or starting artwork or getting into it, or even taking their artwork to the next level, what would you give them? Um, some of the some of the advice I would give. Um, for one, I would tell them that. That, that they will have to be patient, you know. Uh, two, I would say you will have to practice a lot. Practice and patience, believe me. The more that you do it, the more that you will get better. Um, no. Um, other things I would say, too, is like, you know, if somebody, if you ask for advice, um, make sure you, I want to say you take all of it. Because it's one of those things that you could still disagree with somebody, certain things. Um, but it's always nice to hear people's perspective on certain on certain things. Like if you're looking to get into like what I do now, like with the, with what I do with my convention appearances, right? Um, it's one of those things. I'm like, everything's not easy. Everything, it's you have to really understand, do your research on what, what's good, what's bad, you know, what's gonna, especially with those kind of shows that I do, it's all about, for me, it's all about what's hot at that moment. So you have to make sure you have to do something that's, you know, that's gonna be creative for that, for the environment that you're in to make money. Cause at the end of the day, you gotta make money. So when it comes to like art in general, you know, I just tell people like, you know, if you keep practicing, you keep drawing, 
you know, that sounds cliche. I get it. But if you keep doing it, think, you know, you'll get better at it because the more that you step away from it, you're not going to get better at it. Um, Absolutely. You know, and then I know like there's times where I've given advice to people and they hit me up. Hey, you know, can you give me advice to this or like how to use this? Sometimes people don't like it, but I tell them that for a reason. So like, for example, if somebody's telling me about like supplies, right? Hey, what kind of color pencils do you use? Or how can I do this or that? I always tell them, I'm like, make sure if you if you're gonna buy it or you're gonna use these, make sure you use them because they're expensive. Supplies are also pretty expensive. And there was one guy who I told him about the markers, right? Because when I do my anime stuff, I use markers for a base. Then I go over it with color pencil. So when the guy started investing in the markers that I use, the guy spent like freaking like 300 bucks on them. Wow. Right. Yeah. Beforehand, I told him, I was like, make sure. I was just like, I told him, I gave him the advice. I was like, honestly, you should start off with basic color pencils first before you move up. Because you never know what could happen. You could never, you never know if you're going to get away from it or not. Right. So I was like, you can start off with the basic stuff, you know. Uh, and then once you feel like, hey, I've done enough here, let me move up. Then you go on to the next. Because I, that's actually how I started doing my anime stuff. Because the anime stuff, I'll go like regular color pencil, stuff like that, right? Mm-hmm. But I felt like I could do better. So when I ask somebody, like, for some point, I'm like, hey, what do you use for, with this? And they told me, like, oh, I use uh, these kind of, I use like carpet markers, I use prism color markers. So when I started looking into it, I'm like, oh, this is pretty interesting. But at that time, I was already confident with myself that I knew if I could use these, it's going to elevate my game. So there's always there's always a little bit different for somebody like a beginner. Yeah. But that's why I always tell them, like, hey, start off like this first. Because if you start off like this first and then you feel comfortable, hey, I, I think I've gotten used to I think I've handled this pretty well. Let me move up to the next step. Yeah. And there's a lot of times where I've seen people do that. They spend all this money on stuff and then it just sits there. So the guy ends up giving me all his markers because he didn't use them. So I was like mm-hmm. I mean I ended up getting a bunch of free markers. That's cool. But I was like <laughs> at the end of the day you just spent all that money for something that you didn't even use, you know? And mm-hmm. that's part of it too. Like what I when I give advice, it's about that matters too because if you're trying if you're trying to get to the next level, you're trying to get to it's not easy. It's you know financially, especially like the stuff that I do, it's you know money's coming out of your pocket. All these shows that I do is from my pocket. It's not like I have sponsors or everything is coming from me. So like it's always one of those things like you know you got to be mindful of what you're doing. And if it's something that you're really that you really want to do, you have to be 100 percent committed. Like you have to go pretty much all in on it. So yeah. that's probably pretty much the best pointers I can give out. Sweet brother, sweet. Where can we find you at, man? Uh, you can find me on social media, uh, JM Punk three two one, um, Twitter and Instagram. Um, you can also follow the True Hood Heat Wrestling YouTube channel. I'm there every. Monday nights, uh, every Wednesday nights, uh, and then pretty much whenever I can just pop up on watch alongs. I know they're doing a watch along tonight uh, for what Impact Slam anniversary, I think. Uh, probably won't be on there, but yeah, that's pretty much you go, where you can find me at. Sweet, sweet. Well, brother, I want to thank you for being on the show, man. I had a great time. I really did. Nah, man, thank really you for did. having me. And no problem, A. And and for everybody watching, uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for hanging out. And uh, just know you guys are extraordinary. Have a nice day. Mm.